Factsverse presents The Incredible Story of the Most Decorated Marine in American History Before we get into this video, please click the like button and also be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you don't miss our future videos. Every man and woman who serves in any branch of the military is a hero. Not only do they dedicate their lives to fighting for our country, they also leave behind their families, their friends, and their lives to go overseas and to fight for our freedom. While all people who serve in the military are heroes, there are some who do something so brave and so amazing that they stand out above the rest. One of these servicemen is Lewis Burwell Chesty Puller from Virginia. This is the incredible story of the most decorated Marine in American history. Chesty is an all-American hero. He has served in conflicts all over the world. During World War II, he fought in the Pacific. He also fought in the Korean War in the 1950s. He was a strong and brave Marine. While he died close to 50 years ago, he is still a legend. Most Marines today know about him and about his acts of heroism. It's unusual for a Marine who died so long ago to still be a legend within the ranks of this elite branch of the U.S. military. Puller was born in June 1898 in West Point, Virginia. His father's name was Matthew, and his mother's name was Martha. His father worked as a grocer, but sadly he passed away when Puller was only 10 years old. Since Puller had no father, he didn't have a strong male role model in his life. To make up for that, his mom had him spend hours listening to tales from former servicemen from the American Civil War. The Civil War ended in 1865, about 30 years before Puller was ever born, and that gave him a chance to meet plenty of veterans who fought in the war audibly. One of the young boy's heroes was the legendary Confederate General Stonewall Jackson. In 1916, Puller was a teenager. He decided he wanted to join the Army and see some action. He wanted to have stories of his own to tell. He thought the Army would be perfect so he could play in the same area that the border war with Mexico took place. Unfortunately, he was told that he was too young to enlist on his own. He was told that he would need to get permission from his mother. But when it came time for his widowed mother to sign the papers, she refused to give him permission. Even though his first attempt to join the military didn't go as planned, he didn't give up. He knew that he wanted to join the military and nothing was going to stop him. He realized he just had to wait until he was of age, so he chose to be patient and wait until that day came. In 1917, he was finally able to take the first steps towards joining the U.S. military by enrolling in training at the Virginia Military Institute. This was the oldest service college in the United States. Unfortunately, that still wasn't enough for him. He was ambitious. When the United States got involved in World War I in April of that year, Puller said, I want to go where the guns are. Finally, in August 1918, Puller's dreams were realized. He was finally able to join the United States Marine Corps. When he signed up, he was a private. He was then sent to boot camp on Paris Island in South Carolina. The reason that he chose the Marines was that he had heard about their determined fighting during the 1918 Battle of Belleau Wood in France. During that battle, the German forces gave the members of the military their nickname Devil Dogs, and Puller decided that he wanted to be one to tame those dogs. Unfortunately for Puller, World War I ended in November of that year. He never had a chance to fire a shot against the enemy. Even worse, when he graduated from officer training school as a second lieutenant in his home state in 1919, peacetime cutbacks to the Marines meant that he was surplus to requirements. Fortunately for Puller and the people of the United States, he was determined. Almost immediately after getting the news, he re-enlisted as a corporal. It was then that he was deployed to Haiti to join the paramilitary police. He was ranked as a lieutenant there. It was his team's job to keep peace in Haiti while it occupied the United States. He was in Haiti for five years, and during that time, he was involved in over 40 missions against insurgents. When his service in Haiti was complete, his rank as lieutenant with the Marines was restored in 1924. For the next four years of his service, he trained other Marines on various bases around Virginia. In 1928, when Puller was 30 years old, another foreign deployment came up. He and his team were sent to Nicaragua. There, he was going to fight guerrilla forces that were opposed to the U.S. occupation of the Central American country. 
The rebels in Nicaragua, who were led by August Sandino, were known as the Sandista. The name is still familiar today in Nicaraguan politics. When Puller was serving in Nicaragua, he earned his very first recognition of his bravery. He earned the Navy Cross, which is the second highest military award given for outstanding courage in action. He earned the medal while fighting in 1930 when he was in command of the Nicaraguan National Guard Troop. He received his Navy Cross when he led his men in five successful engagements against a very large number of armed bandit forces. During those engagements, nine of the bandits were killed and many others were wounded. When he received his Navy Cross, the military stated that he was an intelligent and forceful leader. While this was a huge honor, it wouldn't be his last. In 1931, Puller was transferred back to the United States so that he could take a 12-month course for company officers at Fort Benning in Georgia. Toward the end of the next year, he went back to Nicaragua. While he was there for a short time, he managed to earn his second Navy Cross. In fact, he earned this award in a little over a week after returning. During this time, he engaged in a series of battles against the Sandistas. His superiors saw this and awarded him his second Navy Cross. This time, they said that he was given the award for his indomitable courage and persistence. When Puller's time in Central America came to an end, he was transferred to China, and it was there that he joined an elite unit known as the China Marines. It was his job to guard the American diplomatic service in Beijing. Over the next few years, his time was divided between East Asia while on board the USS Augusta and in the United States as a trainer in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In August 1941, while Puller held the rank of lieutenant, he went to North Carolina. There, he took up the command of a Marine battalion. For Puller, this was perfect timing. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, which caused the United States to get involved with World War II. In September of the next year, Puller and his unit were sent to Guadalcanal in the South Pacific. He led his men into action against the Japanese. It was a six-month battle, and it was the largest battle of the Solomon Islands. It was during this time that Puller earned his third Navy Cross. He was awarded the medal in the last days of October 1942. The night he earned the medal, the South Pacific was being drenched with tropical rainfall. Puller's battalion and a second infantry unit were on the front lines, stretching for about a mile. They were defending the perimeter of Henderson Field, which was an airbase that the Marines had captured from the Japanese earlier in the year. The enemy tried repeatedly to reclaim the airfield. That night, they launched a night attack and their force outnumbered the United States forces. During the three-hour exchange, 70 of the Americans defending the perimeter lost their lives. Close to 1,400 of the Japanese combatants were killed during the battle and were not successful in taking over the airbase. Since Puller was in charge, he was awarded the Navy Cross again. This time, his superiors stated that he courageously withstood the enemy's desperate and determined attacks. The higher-ups believed that Puller, who was now a lieutenant colonel, was largely responsible for the successful defense of the airbase where his troops were assigned. And that was not Puller's last display of bravery. In January 1944, he was in the Pacific where he led his men on the island of New Britain in New Guinea. During the Battle of Cape Gloucester, Puller and his unit came under fire from the Japanese with machine guns and mortar fire. Puller led his men in a successful counteroffensive. They stood amazingly strong and defended their position. Due to their successful mission and Puller's bravery and courage during combat, he was awarded his fourth Navy Cross. In November 1944, Puller, who by now was a highly decorated officer, returned to the United States. He was assigned to take command of the Infantry Training Regiment, which was based at Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina. When World War II ended, commanders in Pearl Harbor and New Orleans also traveled to the base. During this time there, Puller felt restless. He still had an appetite for action and training other soldiers wasn't what he intended to do. He wanted to see some action. Well, finally, in June 1950, the Korean War broke out, and that gave Puller yet another chance to show the Marines what he was capable of. By this point, Puller was a full-fledged colonel. He led the 1st Marine Regiment while ashore in Incheon, South Korea. Shortly after his arrival in September 1950, he earned the Silver Star Medal, which is given for valiant efforts and bravery. Just three months after receiving the Silver Star, his bravery at the Battle of Chosun Reservoir earned him his fifth Navy Cross. That is something that not many Marines have ever accomplished. It was then, while serving in Korea, he made one of his most famous statements. 
At the time, his unit was being surrounded by enemy troops, and he said, "'All right, they're on our left, they're on our right, they're in front of us, they're behind us. They can't get away this time.'" This quote became so famous that the Marine Corps Times, a service newspaper, printed it in 1999. He was really showing what an incredible asset he was to the Marines. Along with his five Navy Crosses and his many campaign medals, he was also awarded an Army Distinguished Service Cross. This award made him the most decorated U.S. Marine in history. After serving in the Marines for four decades and taking part in plenty of battles, he retired in 1955. In 1971, at the age of 73, he passed away. After his death, he was made Lieutenant General. Despite his chest full of medals, which is why his nickname was Chesty, many Marines felt that he didn't get what he deserved. Most Marines feel that he should have received the highest United States military award, the Medal of Honor. To this day, when Marine cadets are in a boot camp, at the end of the day they say, good night, Chesty, wherever you are. This man was absolutely amazing. He helped the United States with many battles, and it all started when he was a boy listening to stories of the Civil War. Thanks to those men who enjoyed spending their time telling stories, he chose to become a United States Marine. Without his service, many of our country's battles may not have been won. Show your support for Chesty, leave your comment below, and subscribe for more.